I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. No, folks, you're not imagining it. You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. Gene, uh, excuse me, uh, Craig Smith called me today and said that he had some personal business to take care of uh, this evening. And so The Hour of the Time is coming to you in the place of Craig Smith and his uh, show, Trends. He will be back at the same time on the same station on Monday, just like always. We're going to tickle your fancy tonight. I'm going to stop you all in your tracks and make you think, I hope. So, don't go away, folks. We've got a lot of things to tell you. Our founding fathers did something that had never been done before upon the face of this entire earth. They pointed to the heavens and they said, there is a God. And God has endowed man with unalienable rights. They did not say inalienable rights, and you all should take that out of your vocabulary right now. For documentation as to the proper terminology, read the Declaration of Independence, and you will see that they are unalienable rights, which means that they cannot be taken away by anyone, not even by you yourself, since they were creator in doubt. They built this nation upon that founding principle, for without it man is no better than the beasts of the field and is subject to whomever or whatever is the strongest or the smartest or the cruelest or the most benevolent. You throws the dice and you take your chances. They founded a nation under law the natural law, based upon that one fact that there is a creator who has set in motion the entire universe, the solar system, and put in place the laws which govern that which he created. One of the tenets of our founding fathers was that this nation was based upon the common law, that is, the law that all peoples throughout history have determined over the millennium to be just, accepted by all men everywhere as being just. The common law stated that the only one who can protect the creator-endowed rights endowed upon an individual is that individual, him or herself. No one else can do it under the law. The common law is the basis of the law upon which the Constitution of the United States of America and the Bill of Rights were written. At this present moment, ladies and gentlemen, we have lost most of our Creator endowed rights supposedly protected by the Constitution. We have no constitutional rights. We have never had any constitutional rights. We have always had creator endowed rights protected by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, limiting government and prohibiting government from infringing upon or taking away our creator endowed rights. Over the years, we have become apathetic, complacent, ignorant, and yes, folks, even stupid. I have heard people say that it's not our fault, and I'm here to tell you that that, ladies and gentlemen, is a lie. It is our fault, for we have given, we have given everything that hundreds of thousands of men and women have died for throughout the history of the United States of America to preserve. No one has taken it from us. We have freely given it away by our ignorance, through our apathy, and, of course, as a result of the great mass of stupidity that reigns across 
this country. Does it make you mad? If it does, then you are indeed a sheeple. If you understand what I'm talking about and want to do something about it, listen. And don't forget to tune in later at midnight Eastern, 11 Central, 10 Mountain, and 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for the hour of the time, for that is the time that we are regularly broadcast Monday through Friday night. Every Monday through Friday night. We can no longer afford to be so wide-eyed and childlike, so stupid, so apathetic, and so ignorant. Americans must grow up, must become real adults, must stop believing what they are told and what they read, begin their own program of independent research, and start knowing, knowing. There's a great difference between believing what you are told and knowing what the truth is. The United States of America was founded on a moral tax revolt in the late 1700s. In the late 1700s. There's a tax revolt occurring now in the late 1900s. Both tax revolts share a common catalyst, that is, tyranny of government. Of the 37 particular grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence, 32 of them, ladies and gentlemen, or 86%, are again serious issues for complaint today. Now, if you don't believe that, you should read your copy of the Declaration of Independence. You see, every true American should have a copy of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence in their home. For those documents constitute the founding principles and ideals upon which this country began its life. And the Constitution and Bill of Rights are the supreme law of this land. And if you do not have a copy of those documents and do not know what they say and understand what is contained in those documents, then you are by no means an American and have no right to call yourself an American. Of the 37 particular grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence, 32 of them are 86% are again serious issues for complaint today. The American Revolution 200 years ago was a bloody one. Today's revolt needn't be, needn't be, for we've inherited the Constitution. We don't have to reinvent the constitutional wheel. We only need to get it rolling again and apply it for it is being ignored by those whom it was written to limit. They do not even pay attention to its limitations now. If Americans don't wake up, if the great herds of sheeple in this nation do not wake up, I can assure you that blood will again flow in this nation. Now, if you will learn to vigorously invoke your God-given constitutional liberties, described by Alan Bloom in the closing of the American mind as, quote, hard won over centuries by the alliance of philosophic genius and political heroism consecrated by the blood, by the blood of martyrs, unquote. Our second battle for American freedom will be won, and can be won bloodless and within the law. It is too late for appeasement. It is too late for appeasement. It is too late for half-truths. Despots and other moral vandals may call other lands home, but they do not belong in America. We deserve to know the unvarnished truth about our money and taxes, but if you're not willing to exert the effort, you see it takes work to find the truth, and the truth is elusive at best. If you are not willing to expend that energy to find it, then you will surely get what you deserve. The limousine liberals have lied to us long enough. The Potomac parasites have cheated us long enough. The Caviar Congress has lived high on the hog long enough. The Washington wastrels have blown our billions long enough. We should not fear our servant, the government. The federal government should fear and respect its master, we, the American people. 
After all, that is what the Constitution says. That is what America stands for. However, we are taking orders from our federal yard boy. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 7 says, I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. The Internal Revenue Service and taxes are like bad weather. Everybody loves to complain, but nobody does anything about them except a small handful of people scattered about this country who really understand the law and apply it. The rest of us, we know already how to complain, but today, folks, it is time for some action. A few days ago, as they do every year at this time of year, Philip Marsh, which used to run the Pilot Connection, which is now called the Liberty Foundation, was raided by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They were raided by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Every piece, every stick of furniture, every piece of paper, every person was arrested and carted off to jail. They had been teaching Americans the true law and the truth about the Internal Revenue Service, the criminal Internal Revenue Service, and the Federal Reserve, which is not an agency of the United States government. And they had been legally untaxing American citizens through the real, the true law. Every year they do this. And all you see in the newspapers is that these people have been arrested. And they imply that they have been charged with violation of the tax law, or evading taxes, or for not filing tax returns, or for not paying their taxes. And they are all lies. They are always arrested on misdemeanors, little charges, and they are usually out within a few days, and then they don't bother them again for another year. You see, the whole purpose of these raids, ladies and gentlemen, is to cower the rest of you sheeple into falling in line, filling out your tax returns and paying them, even though, even though, if you fulfill the proper requirements under the law, you do not have to. The income tax system is voluntary. At 9 a.m. this morning, this morning, Friday, December the 10th, federal marshals raided the Save a Patron organization, a patriot, I'm sorry, the Save a Patriot organization on Carroll Street in Westminster, Maryland. Everyone was arrested and carted off to jail. Every stick of furniture, every piece of paper was confiscated. And, of course, no one will ever see any of those items ever again. This happens on a yearly basis operating under the color of law, why would the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms raid a foundation engaged in exercising their First Amendment rights under the Constitution to educate Americans on the real law? You see, there's nothing illegal about what any of these people were doing. Now, I want you to pay close attention, folks. These are the natural laws of government. Nothing, number one, nothing in our material world, regardless of the form of government, can come from nowhere or go nowhere, nowhere nor can it be free. Everything in our economic life was produced by taking risks and has a source, a destination, and a cost that must be paid by someone, somewhere. A nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. A man or a woman without principles for which they are ready and willing to die for at any given moment that they are called upon to do so, are already dead and are of no use or consequence to anyone, not even themselves. Government is never a source of goods. It is only a source of costs to society. 
Everything produced is produced by the people. And everything the government gives to one group of people, it must first take or plunder from another group of people. Because of government's inherent inefficiency and waste, the amount given by government will always be less than the amount taken. And all of you sheeple out there waiting for your free health care plan are in for a big surprise. Big, big surprise. Nothing is free. And all of you who think we must have taxes and we must have government in order to pave our highways are even bigger fools. For if you would pool your money and pave your own highways, it wouldn't cost you five times as much by the time you paid it in as taxes and it went to the centralized federal government and came back to you. Don't you understand how that works? The only revenue that government has to spend is that revenue taxed or borrowed out of people's earnings. When government decides to spend more than it has received from these sources, that extra unearned revenue is created out of thin air, through the banks and printing presses, and when spent takes on value only by reducing the value of all currency, savings, and insurance. And this is called inflation. Wages, not profits, are the principal cost of everything. So real wages, or wages adjusted for inflation, cannot be increased unless there are increases in production and productivity. Productivity is based on human energy, both physical and mental, and tools. Tools are created and replaced by capital formation, which can come only from savings. And there isn't much of that in this country, is there? Savings and thus capital formation can come only from profits or surplus. Try to invest losses or deficits, if you don't believe me. The greater the profits, the greater the possible savings and investment. What a government taxes, such as work, savings, and investment, it gets less of. What a government subsidizes, such as unemployment, debt, consumption, it gets more of. Debt is always repaid, if not by the borrower than by the lender. Many lenders are about to discover this as their loans come due. History, ladies and gentlemen, teaches that the most productive and the richest societies in the world with the most security have always had the most personal freedom. In effect, the smallest government as well as the strongest property rights. There are no human rights without property rights. Democracy is a code word for socialism. Stop saying that this country is a democracy, for every time you do it, you ingrain the inroads that socialism has made into this country, and you solidify, you solidify the destruction of the republic. The republic, the republic, the republic. Government power always lusts for more power and continually usurps it from the people. Government power corrupts, and absolute government power corrupts absolutely. The size of government and the amount of corruption are always directly proportional. Government power is always abused by seizing and perverting the law, operating under the color of law. The real law ceases to exist. And with few exceptions, government always determines what is law. Government power is overcome or held in check only by the application of a stronger power. Government power is never, ever, in your wildest dreams, surrendered voluntarily. That stronger power must be, and can only be, the people who collectively have the strength. No government can exist on the face of this earth without the will of the people. The people's power comes from God. If you have no God, you have no power. You are subject to the laws of the jungle. 
Now that these natural laws of government have been explained, let's talk about money. Before we ever discuss taxes, and this show isn't long enough for us to even get to taxes, but simply because we're not going to get there during this one hour, let me assure you that the income tax is unconstitutional. If it is mandated that you must obey and must file and must pay and must sign your signature, all of those things fly in the face of the Constitution. They violate almost, almost every article and every clause and every amendment of the first ten amendments. If you don't believe that, again, get out your Constitution and your Bill of Rights and read them and apply them to what you are required to do when you file and report and pay income taxes. It is a direct tax. Therefore, the only way it can be legal is if it is voluntary. And the only way it can be voluntary, because the federal government has no, no authority and no jurisdiction within the several states, which are independent countries, united for their mutual benefit and protection. You see, under the proper law, the federal government has no power within the states. And the only way that it can tax is to tax the states. And then the states have the authority to tax their citizens. Where have you been, Rip Van Winkle? Or I should say, Rip Van Sheeple? Why is it that Americans don't understand their own, their own law, their own country? How have you fallen into this deception so easily? Well, I'll tell you. It started, ladies and gentlemen, with social security. No one would voluntarily give up their rights or their citizenship without some benefit in return. So they dangle their carrot called social security. We will take care of you in your old age. And they did it to a generation of people who had experienced a Great Depression and were extremely, extremely wary and very, very insecure about the future. Many of them had set aside nothing for their old age. So this carrot, this carrot looked very good to them. They were not told the conditions of the contract that they would be entering into with the federal government which only has authority within the boundaries of that parcel of land known as Washington, D.C. And, and the territories which come under the jurisdiction of the federal government. They had no idea that they would be giving up their state citizenship and their constitutional rights and would then become a 14th Amendment citizen of the Federal District of Columbia. And those citizens have no constitutional rights. You see, the Constitution itself allowed for the creation of that limited area, which would be governed by the Congress, and the Constitution gives the Congress the right, the right, to legislate in all cases whatsoever. In other words, for anyone who is a citizen of the Federal District of Columbia, there are no constitutional rights and they are subject to the whims of the Federal Government and the Congress. When you accepted your Social Security number, you became a 14th Amendment citizen of the Federal District of Columbia. You gave up your state citizenship. And you gave up your constitutional rights. And for those people, you must file your income tax returns and you must pay your income tax. For you are not protected. You are not protected. You don't ever get anything for nothing. Nothing is free. Everything that you enter into is a contract. Most contracts have provisions and requirements. And you either give something or you lose something. 
Are you gaining something in every contract that you ever enter into? That's how it has happened. And that's how it continues to happen. And you will cement your slavery. And you will put another bolt in your shackles and you will tighten it down around your ankles even tighter when you accept your free health plan from the federal socialist democracy in Washington, D.C. You see, folks, the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their right name. That's an ancient Chinese proverb. Now, why is it that they want this income tax? You see, before it was put into effect, the federal government existed quite well on the legal taxes provided for in the Constitution. Had no problems with money. The Congress was responsible for the creation of money in this country. And the Constitution specifically stated that no state shall make anything other than gold or silver coin an instrument in payment of debt. I can guarantee you that none of the states are using gold or silver coin as payment of debt. They're using fiat money or counterfeit money, which has no backing, cannot be converted, is in fact an instrument of debt, is in fact an instrument of notification of the bankruptcy of the United States of America if you want to know the truth. Now, to survive, we must trade with others for things we do not have and cannot make. Even the most reclusive of hermits must trade with others, at least occasionally. Truly, no man is an island. There are only two possible manners of trading, direct and indirect. The direct trade of goods is commonly known as barter. Don't go away, folks. I'll be right back after this short pause. You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. I want everybody to get up close to your radio, because we're going to get serious tonight, folks. We're going to get real serious Tonight, 9 a.m., 9 a.m. this morning, December the 10th, federal marshals raided the Save a Patriot Foundation on Carroll Street in Westminster, Maryland, arrested everyone present, took every stick of furniture, every piece of paper, every piece of equipment, every copy machine, every typewriter, everything. Just three days ago, in Colorado, the Liberty Foundation, which used to be the Pilot Connection, founded by Philip Marsh and his wife Marlene, was raided by agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Everyone was arrested. Every stick of furniture, every piece of cloth, every typewriter, every piece of paper, every record even the pictures on the walls were taken. One of the ten amendments in the Bill of Rights is, states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be searched. I'll let you guess which number amendment this is, and I'll turn the program back to Bill. The liberty, ladies and gentlemen, of a circus elephant is restrained to a confined area by a chain that binds him. Though this chain is but a thread, compared to his massive bulk, it provides control, because the elephant falsely believes the chain cannot be broken. This false belief is ingrained into the elephant's mind by the trainers at infancy by chaining the elephant to a stake when the chain was strong enough to bind him. 
Once this hoax is established, it is all that is needed to control the adult elephant to act the way the trainer wants it to act. The elephant is controlled by the trainer's humbug. You are about to be shocked. Though different from a Stephen King novel, this horror story is true. You'll be shocked at what you hear, for it strongly counters with virtually everything you've been led to believe about money, taxes, law, and government. Ladies and gentlemen, we have lost our country. We have lost America. It is gone. I don't mean we're going to lose America or that we're currently in the process of losing America. I mean we have already lost America. She has been abducted like a child. Like a child. And this program is about waking the sheeple so that we can take her back. It is no longer protecting her. It is no longer saving her. It is going to take her back. You work until May 7th each year for the federal government. Not until approximately May 8th do you finally begin to work for yourself and your family. And with the recent tax increases, it's longer than that. You're barely keeping your head above the water. And that's all you and most other Americans are doing, just getting by, just surviving. But life is not mere survival. Life is about living. Living is about travel, quality education for your children, starting that business that you've always dreamed of, sending your folks on the honeymoon they never had, buying that home which you can pass down to your children and they to their grandchildren. Can you afford your dreams? Can you afford to live? Not with this income tax albatross around your deck. Survive, maybe. Live? Never. Unless the federal gorging of our hard-earned money is sharply curbed, the middle-class Americans will soon be suffering under a 45% income tax, 20% Social Security contributions tax, 5% national sales tax, 20% inflation or hidden tax, gasoline taxes, local sales taxes, etc., 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 license fees. Did you know that the average federal bureaucrat pulls down over $42,000 a year while the rest of us make only 28000 on the average? And if that doesn't get you angry, nothing will. Are you not paying through the nose already? How much higher do taxes have to get? Why are you even wearing the income tax albatross? Folks, it's because you believe. You know nothing. You just believe what you're told. You're told you have to file every year, and you're told you have to pay, and you're told that you must join the Social Security system, and you're told this and that and the other thing by your parents and by your preacher and by the Air Force, Army, or Navy recruiter or by your coach or your school or your counselor, and you believe, you believe you make a religion out of life. You know nothing. One, you believe that the law requires you to wear this albatross. And number two, you believe it's an American duty to wear it. If the taxpayers of this country ever discover that the Internal Revenue Service operates on 90% bluff, the entire system of fraud and coercion will collapse. And that is a statement made by an IRS official in 1969. Now, let me open your eyes just a little bit. Neither the law nor any American duty requires you to pay federal income tax. You have been fooled into believing that you are required. The Internal Revenue Service is actually a big bluff, and the only power it has over you is through your own fear, guilt, and ignorance. And after a while, you just become stupid. 
After listening to this program, you may still feel guilty or fearful. And there's not a damn thing that I can do about that. These are personal emotions which each of you will have to individually battle. Fear and guilt are, however, sons of ignorance. Sons of ignorance. How would you like to start enjoying 100% take-home pay without violating any law or duty, without harming America, within as little as 30 days? At the moment, your tax freedom day is May 8th. That's the day you finally start working for yourself and your family. After reading many different books that you can procure, purchase, or even pick up in your own library occasionally, and applying your new knowledge, you can move your tax freedom day to as near January 1st as you desire. All you have to do is stop believing, start knowing, and then use your knowledge. Use your knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these raids and arrests are play-acting. They do this every single year, right at the end of the year, when all of you are beginning to think about your taxes. It is done to scare you into not following through, into not learning the true law, into not, not going against those who would steal Deal, ladies and gentlemen, half of your income each year. You say, oh no, I'm in the 28% bracket. No, you're not. You're in the funny farm. You add up your 28% bracket, your sales taxes, your gasoline taxes, your fees, your license fees, your registration fees, your mortgage points. All of these, ladies and gentlemen, are taxes. Taxes. And when you get through adding them up, you'll find that you pay 50% of your income every year to taxes. The income tax is a direct tax levied against the people. And if it's mandatory, it's illegal. The only way the income tax can be legal is if it is voluntarily, voluntarily given. Just filling out an income tax form and signing your name is a violation of the fifth article in amendment to the Constitution. You are then required to testify against yourself. And I could go on and on and on. You see, none of the people arrested at Colorado Springs with the Liberty Foundation, were charged with anything having to do with taxes. Because they were not doing anything illegal. Nothing illegal at all. The Save a Patriot Foundation was doing nothing illegal. Nothing whatsoever. And none of the charges filed against them had anything to do with income tax evasion or failure to file or failure to pay, or anything else. And there's no such thing as failure to pay, ladies and gentlemen. There are no debtors' prisons in the United States of America, in case you don't know that. So, what's going on? Well, Richard E. Byrd, Speaker of the Virginia House of Delegates, on March 3rd, 1910, argued against the passage of the Income Tax 16th Amendment, said this, quote, a hand from Washington will be stretched out and placed upon every man's business. The eye of the federal inspector will be in every man's counting house. The income tax law will of necessity have inquisitorial features. It will provide penalties. It will create a complicated machinery. Under it, businessmen will be hauled into courts distant from their homes. Heavy fines imposed by distance and unfamiliar tribunals will constantly menace the taxpayer. An army of federal inspectors, spies, and detectives will descend upon the state. They will compel men of business to show their books and disclose the secrets of their affairs. They will dictate forms of bookkeeping. They will require statements and affidavits. 
On the one hand, the inspector can blackmail the taxpayer, and on the other, he can profit by selling his secret to his competitor. The above red prophecy has become frighteningly true. Everything Mr. Bird forewarned is happening today. In fact, it's even worse. In the name of income tax collection, an Alaska woman was dragged out of her car over broken window glass by IRS agents so that they could seize the car. To enforce income tax collection on the Inglewood Learning Center daycare school, the children were literally held hostage in a barricaded room by Detroit Internal Revenue Service agents and not released to their parents until the parents signed over what they owed the school to the IRS because the school was delinquent in its taxes. Can you imagine that? What would you do if that happened to your children? These kinds of stories, ladies and gentlemen, are not the exception. They are the rule. All across America, teams of heavily armed Internal Revenue Service and Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms agents are swooping into family homes at dawn to seize property, often for assessments less than $100. The IRS is clearly rabid, rabid with power and out of control, and is, in fact, a criminal a criminal collection bureau for the privately owned Federal Reserve System. You see, not one single dollar of any taxes that any of you people are paying goes to pay for one bridge or one road or one federal employee's salary. If you will look at the back of your canceled checks after you have sent them in in payment of your supposed taxes, look at the back and you will see that it says pay pay to the account of any Federal Reserve Bank in payment of U.S. obligations. Suckers. When are you going to wake up, sheeple? How long is this going to continue? Why are you giving everything up? Why are you flushing everything the several hundred thousand men and women have died to preserve and pass down to us. Why are you flushing it down the toilet? How dare you? How dare you? How many of you sent your sons and daughters off to fight a war in the desert in the Middle East and haven't got the guts to fight for what's right here? You're hypocrites. You're liars. You see, no one's taking this country away from us. We are giving it up. Like so many groveling, whimpering dogs. I told you we were going to get right in the middle of it, folks. Myths. 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 What you believe without knowing anything. Income means any money that comes in. You believe that, but it's not true. You make taxable income by merely earning a paycheck. You believe that, but it's not true. Your employer is required by law to withhold federal income taxes. You believe that, but it is not true. In fact, most employers are withholding income taxes against the law. You believe you are required by law to pay federal income tax on private sector wages. You believe it, but it isn't true. Sometimes, somewhere, somebody told you these things and you believed it. You never checked. I doubt if more than three people in all of the listening audience to this broadcast have ever even seen the Internal Revenue Code or any of the laws governing the income tax, much less read them. You should hang your heads in shame, for you are feeding the New World Order. You are helping it to come to pass. And in the process of feeding the New World Order, you are destroying this country. You are stripping yourself of your creator-endowed rights and the protection given to you under the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Because you are greedy and ignorant and lazy. 
I don't know how many times I hear across this country, I'm too busy making a living to study this stuff. There's a lot of things I'd like to say to people who say that. I usually don't. I usually don't. I usually let the fires rage within me and I don't say anything. You believe you are required by law to have social security number. And it is not so. You believe you are required by law to join the social security program. And it is not true. You believe you are required to pay social security contributions. And it is not true. You believe social security taxes are held for you in a trust fund. And there is no such thing. You believe you are legally owed your future, future Social Security benefits, and you are not. You believe Social Security will be there for you when you are old. Go talk to an elderly person and find out the truth. Sometimes, somewhere, somebody told you these things and you believed them, but they are lies. You believe your rights come from the government, and that is not true. That is not true. Our founding fathers did something that no one has ever done on this earth before. They said there is a God, and God has endowed upon mankind certain unalienable rights. Not inalienable rights. And I'm sick of hearing you twist around our founding fathers' words. Read the Declaration of Independence. The words are unalienable rights. Unalienable. Unalienable. Unalienable rights granted to us by a creator. The Constitution was written as a contract between the sovereign people and the sovereign states together for their mutual benefit and protection to protect those creator-endowed rights and to secure them and to guarantee the pursuit of life, liberty, and property, not happiness. Read the words of our founding fathers. Without property rights, there are no rights. You believe the government can require you to waive your rights, and that is a lie. Creator-endowed rights cannot be waived. You cannot give them up. You believe that you can be required by law to be a witness against yourself. And that is a lie. You believe you are required by law to file federal income tax returns. And that is a lie. It is a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. You believe you are required to show your books records to an IRS audit. And that is a lie. You can never be required to testify or bring testimony against yourself. Sometimes, somewhere, somebody told you these things and you believed it, but they are lies. You believe what's good for the federal government is good for America, and that is a lie. What's good for the individual is good for America. You believe you have a duty to the federal government, and that is a lie. You have a duty to the Constitution and to the Bill of Rights and to nothing else. You believe those who resist the federal government are traitors to America, and so you help the destruction of the rights of the individual, and you help to create the usurpation of the creator-endowed rights of the people, and you help to build a huge democratic socialism which will enslave you. Sometime, somewhere, somebody told you these things, and you believe them, but they are lies. You believe that income taxes are the necessary price we pay for civilization, and that is a lie. You believe if we stopped paying income taxes, it would hurt America, and that also is a lie. How did this country survive without income tax for a hundred and seventy some odd years? More than that, actually. You believe you have a moral duty to pay your fair share of taxes. If you volunteer and you wish to pay that money, that's up to you. But you do not have a duty to pay anything other than what is legal and constitutional. 
and a direct tax against the people is not legal, is not constitutional. You believe tax avoidance is a crime like tax evasion, and that is not true. The Supreme Court has ruled that you have a right to avoid taxes legally. You believe that tax avoiders get a free ride and make the rest of us pay more, and that also is a lie. No one has ever paid more because anyone else has refused to pay. You believe if you don't pay your taxes, you deserve to go to jail. <laughs> and that requires no comment from me. Sometimes, somewhere, somebody told you these things and you believe them, but they are lies. You believe the Federal Reserve is part of the federal government, and that is a lie. It is a private corporation. You believe the Federal Reserve notes are dollars, and that is a lie. A dollar is a specific, defined within the law, measurement of gold and silver coin. You believe that inflation is caused by high prices, and that is a lie. Inflation is caused by making counterfeit money available to the people in large amounts, cranking up the printing press and printing out money that has no backing, no support. It is also caused by making available bookkeeping money. In other words, money that doesn't exist in the form of credit. You go to the bank, you borrow $40,000, they make a bookkeeping entry and issue you a check. The money never existed, never will exist, yet you must pay it back with interest. Sucker. Sometimes, somewhere, somebody told you these things and you believed it, but they are lies. You believe the Constitution is archaic and suitable only for a rural society. And that is not true. It is a living Constitution. And the fact that it is not being changed means that the will of the people is for preserving it as it is. You believe the Supreme Court is to interpret the Constitution, and that also is a lie. You believe all regulations must be obeyed as law, and that also is a lie. Most regulations do not even cover you and are not law. Regulations are not law. You believe a juror can only judge the facts and never the law, and that is a lie. The reason our founding fathers created the jury system was to judge the law as well as the facts. Somebody somewhere sometime told you these things and you believed. You believe America was designed to be a democracy, and I hear that word bantied all over this country. Democracy is a code word for socialism and always ends up in destruction from within and a dictator rises to power to clean up the mess. Always. In every instance. This is not a democracy. It was never designed to be a democracy. It is a republic, and most of you don't even know what that word means. You believe the legal term United States always means the 50 states, and that is a lie. You believe the federal government has total authority over the 50 states, and you, and that is a lie. You believe the purpose for the war on drugs is to eliminate drugs. And that is a lie. The only thing it has eliminated is our creator endowed rights guaranteed by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. We have almost lost all of those creator endowed rights protected by the first ten amendments. Don't believe it? You must be standing upside down with your head at least one foot below the surface if you don't know that. You believe we live in a free country and you are a fool. Don't go away. Don't you dare go away because I'm not finished. Ladies and gentlemen, this program, The Hour of the Time, is brought to you by Swiss America Trading. Throughout the history of the world, there's only been one thing, one commodity that has ever protected anyone against total loss of everything that they've ever built up. 
during severe economic trauma, and that one commodity is precious metals in its various forms. If you would like some protection, and I strongly advise you to get a total and complete economic collapse. Now, even if an economic collapse did not occur, if they were successful in conning the American people into accepting a cashless system, thus negating, negating any reason for an economic collapse, there will still be, there will still be a loss in our standard of living simply due to NAFTA. There is no way in the world, ladies and gentlemen, that the American laborer is going to compete with a Mexican laborer who can work for only 50 cents an hour. Their standard of living in this process will come up. Ours will go down and we will meet somewhere in between. Life in this country is not ever going to be the same again. The middle class, ladies and gentlemen, is going to disappear, and that's exactly what this is intended, is intended to do. Karl Marx proposed free trade as a system of leveling, leveling the standard of living between the have nations and the have not nations and creating class wars which would bring about socialism much quicker. Don't believe it? Look at history. There's only one thing throughout the history of the world that has protected the assets of anyone during times of economic trauma, economic collapse, rampant inflation, or depression. It doesn't make any difference. The only way to preserve what you have is to put it into something that never loses its value. And ladies and gentlemen, throughout the history of the world, that has been precious metals in all of its various forms. Now, I'm not one to recommend to you high-value numismatic coins. For when you pay a $1,000 for a coin that only has an actual value in gold content of $100, you've made a big mistake. Because if there is an economic collapse, and I assure you that there will be, there's not going to be a bunch of these coin dealers around to buy back what you bought. Now, there are gold and silver coins to where the numismatic value is within 15 or 20 percent of the gold value, these are good investments. Bags of junk silver are good investments. Pre-1964 silver of any kind is good investments. Now, this is according to me, and according to the investigative work that my organization, the Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence, has performed over the years. There are many other things that are good investments that can protect your money. And I want you to understand I'm talking about only protecting your money. I'm not talking about making profits. I'm not talking about turning something around in a couple of months to make a few thousand dollars. I'm talking about protecting your assets. If you want to talk to some of the best, most honest people that I know who perform that function for you, call Swiss America Trading right now. It's 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. And they're the only ones that I've heard on any of these shortwave broadcasts that will give you a buyback guarantee. A buyback guarantee, ladies and gentlemen. Call them and talk to them about it. And when you talk to these other so-called honest firms, have them send you in writing their buyback guarantee before you talk to them anymore. Do it now. Call 1-800-289-2646. You see, the hour of the time doesn't just take any sponsor. We had a lot of applications from a lot of different people. One of them was another 
firm that deals in precious metals. Out of all the people who applied to sponsor the hour of the time, we could, in all honesty, approve of only one. Swiss America Trading. Call them now. If they don't treat you well, you call me personally, because I want to know about it. I've never known them. To be dishonest, or to treat anyone badly, or to cheat anyone, or to lie to anyone, or to ever give out bad information or wrong information, nor have they ever failed to disclose every single item in the contract that you make with them, not only once, but several times. So, if you want to make sure that you're dealing with good, honest, Christian people, call Swiss America Trading and talk to them tonight. 1-800-289-2646. I back them with my personal reputation, and I won't do that for anyone else. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Ladies and gentlemen, do it now. You'll be glad that you did. Can you remember, folks? Can you even remember when you last bartered for something? I mean, personally traded something on a direct, equal exchange? Well, it happens very rarely because it's difficult to find someone who wants exactly what you have and has exactly what you want, value for value. Thus, the problem with barter is lack of coincidence of wants and indivisibility. A dentist may want some potatoes, but the farmer may not necessarily want any dental work. Even if he did, it would be worth much more than the amount of potatoes the dentist needed according to the prices that I see when I go to the dentist. Dental work, as most services, is indivisible in value. In other words, there's no pulling just half a tooth. And the dentist would find it impractical to make trades for lesser-valued things, and if the farmer wanted to trade for a car, the dealership clearly couldn't accept a huge pile of perishable potatoes, now could he? A medium of exchange, a middle thing, if you will, is needed to facilitate indirect trades. Without a middle thing, we could never trade between large and small, divisible and indivisible, common and rare, perishable and non-perishable, near and far. You see, we need a middle thing which is accepted by dentists, potato farmers, car dealerships, and, of course, everyone else. This middle thing is called money. Money is the hub of society, operating as the common denominator between us all. Otherwise, we as specialists could hardly trade directly with each other, one-on-one. Every civilization is based on and requires indirect trade. For without indirect trade, the dentist would starve and the farmer's teeth would fall out, and then he'd starve. Without indirect trade, we'd all be surviving as primitive savages. Without money, there is no indirect trade, and without indirect trade, there is no civilization. Herbert Spencer once said, and in societies of low civilization, there is no money. This middle thing, this money, must have some intrinsic amount of consistent value. To even have value, money must first be an article of commerce, a good, a commodity. Commodities are things which many people desire. Money is a certain commodity which nearly everybody desires any time, any place. It can be used for something. Commodity has value other than for trade. Understand that. Historically, many different goods have been used as money. Tobacco in colonial Virginia, sugar in the West Indies, salt in Abyssinia, cattle in ancient Greece, nails in Scotland, copper in ancient Egypt, and grain beads, tea, cowrie shells, and fish hooks. Through the centuries, two commodities, and only two, gold and silver, have emerged as money in the free competition of the market and displaced the other commodities as money. The commodity chosen as a medium must be a luxury. Human desires for luxuries are unlimited, and therefore luxury goods are always in demand and will always be acceptable. Wheat is a luxury in underfed civilizations, but not in a prosperous society, not in New York. 
Cigarettes, ordinarily, would not serve as money, but they did in post-World War II Europe, where they were considered a luxury, and they did in Vietnam, where I served as a river patrol boat captain. The term luxury good implies scarcity and high unit value. Having a high unit value, such a good is easily portable. For instance, an ounce of gold is worth a half ton of pig iron. That's from Alan Greenspan's essay, Gold and Economic Freedom. And the second was from Ayn Rand's Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Money, folks, is money only because it's readily exchangeable for something else. And why is it readily exchangeable? Because it has a universally recognized intrinsic value. Intrinsic value. That means the value is within the object. Take out a Federal Reserve note and see if you can find any intrinsic value in that Federal Reserve note. You can't even use it to write on because it's covered with ink. Notice that historically, money, commodities, were useful. Everyday items, either divisible, such as tobacco, sugar, salt, copper, tea, or small, such as nails, beads, seashells, or fish hooks. In pre-industrial times, these items were also luxury goods. However, the more advanced and prosperous a civilization becomes, the more advanced its luxury goods. By 1900, nails, salt, etc. were no longer luxury goods. Modern industrial technology and manufacturing had relegated them to being cheap and plentiful. Money is a means to an end. Money is rarely an end in itself. Few want money for its own sake. For example, in post-war Germany, cigarettes traded as money, even amongst non-smokers. Now, why would non-smokers accept a commodity for which they had no personal use? Folks, it's because they could easily trade cigarettes for something else which did have personal utility, and they knew that the cigarettes would always have value because they knew that those who smoked were addicted and must have cigarettes. To the non-smoker, cigarettes were only a means to an end. To the smoker, cigarettes were a necessity. So what is money? It must be three things. One, a reliable storehouse of intrinsic value. Two, a universal portable medium of exchange. And three, a common unit of account. Now, naturally, the first is the mother of the second. A commodity first must have consistent value to random individuals before it will ever be universally traded. And 6,000 years of human trading experience have decided for good reasons which commodities deserve to be used as money, and that's gold and silver. Now, you might ask, why have gold and silver emerged as the two favorite commodities trading as money? Because, folks, gold and silver are intrinsically valuable. They're scarce and difficult to mine. They're divisible. They're homogeneous, impossible to artificially produce. They're non-perishable. They're durable. They're easily fashioned into convenient coin and desirable for in industrial uses, such as dentistry, jewelry, electronics, photography, chemistry, and many, many others. Their value by weight is neither too concentrated, as rare gems, nor too diluted, as iron. Silver operates neatly as a second tier for small trades, while gold has a more concentrated value for larger trades. And one last reason, one last reason, gold and silver feel like money more than any other commodity, and that is extremely important. Subjectively, people sense that gold and silver are money. Nothing else has the allure of gold and silver. Until ocean mining becomes economically competitive, a very remote prospect, to say the least, gold and silver will rule the money mountain. All nations pay their debts in gold or silver. If the Federal Reserve note was so valuable, or if there was something, something to this fiat counterfeit paper currency thing, why is it that governments will not accept currency as a payment of debt? Have you thought about that? You see, they revel in fooling us, but they don't even try 
to fool each other. Now, government, folks, cannot choose a society's money. Only free traders can resolve the question. Money is not an invention of the state. It is not the product of a legislative act. The sanction of political authority is not necessary for its existence. If the government... If the government disappeared tomorrow, you would all in your individual communities accept a common denominator as your money, and you would continue to trade with each other as if nothing had ever happened. And I tell you now that the true primary articles of trade would be gold and silver. Certain commodities came to be money quite naturally as the result of economic relationships independent of the power of the state, and that's why its value is universal throughout the earth. Not just in one or two countries, but everywhere upon the face of this earth. No matter who you talk to, no matter what the race, no matter what the religion, no matter how remote or how populated. The brilliant Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises proved through his regression theorem that money must first be a freely traded commodity. To solve the baffling question of how a money came to be worth a certain unit price, Mises worked backwards. The value of money on its first day of use as money must logically stem from its consumption value on the previous day, when it was not money. And how does something have consumption value? by having intrinsic value, by being a commodity. So unless money was a commodity at one time used by the free market and individuals decided to start using it as money, there is no way for a money price to be conferred arbitrarily. No government can do it. Now, if you want to see how really stupid you have been and how foolish you really are, take a $1 bill out of your wallet Put it beside a $100 bill and then try to explain to anyone, I don't care who it is, try to explain to anyone the difference between the two. The solution to making money work, folks, as a unit of account, a price, lies, as Mises showed, within the coordinating process of the free market. This insight proves devastating for any dictator a band of elites trying to impose a new currency. When the transition from a barter to a money economy took place, the previous markets and commodity exchange ratios were not suddenly wiped out. The preferences individuals had made known were transferred to the new kind of economy, and money was used as a vehicle. It's a complex process to change from one sort of exchange regime to a new one. And no government authorities, no matter how wise, can replicate it. Money is not wealth. You see, money buys wealth. People accept gold because they can trade or spend it later. Comparatively, little gold is actually consumed by industry. Gold money is traded, and that's what it's for. On this point, the miser Scrooge McDuck has transposed the means with the end. Although gold money indeed has intrinsic worth, its main value is exchangeability. The miser deceives himself that by having a pile of gold, he is rich. But can he eat where or live in his gold? No, of course not. Unless the miser trades some of his gold for food, clothes, and shelter, he will die. That's how the infamous miser, Hetty Green, lived and died in abject squalor despite her $100 million estate. Being broke is a state of finances. Being poor is a state of mind. The miser is an illiterate fool collecting books. I hope you understand that. The miser is an illiterate fool collecting books. He cannot read. Money, folks, is a tool. Like any tool, if money is not used, one might as well not even have it. Clearly, money is meant to be traded or spent, not hoarded, not hoarded in a mattress. Wealth is not money. Wealth is bought with money. Wealth is things and profit-generating assets. Mitchell Innes said once, The eye hath never seen, nor the hand touched a dollar. 
If gold and silver are money, then what is a dollar? A dollar is not a thing. It measures a thing. The term dollar is an adjective, folks, not a noun. According to law, a dollar is a unit of weight, like pounds or tons, which specifies a certain quantity of gold or silver money. And that's why your Federal Reserve note, which says one dollar, is counterfeit. It is, in fact, a lie. It's an instrument of debt, which says that someone owes someone else a dollar. And when you use it to buy something, capital goods, you do not own those goods, for you cannot purchase real worth with an instrument of debt. And that's why you pay taxes upon your property. And that's why you have a certificate of title for your automobile and stood instead of the real patent title. That's why you have a warrant deed for your home and for your land instead of a real patent deed. What you have signifies that someone does indeed own the land, but not you. And that's why you have to pay registration fees and property taxes. Those are your rental payments. And if you fail to make even one of those rental payments, the true owner will repossess his property. Make no mistake about it. You see, our nation has been stolen out from under us. What you think you have does not indeed belong to you at all. The dollar began as the generally applied name of an ounce weight of silver coined by a Bohemian court count named Schlick. Now let me say that again so you'll understand really where this came from. The dollar began as the generally applied name of an ounce weight of silver coined by a Bohemian count named Schlick, and that occurred in the 16th century. The Count of Schlick lived in Joachim's Valley, or Joachimisthal. The Count's coins earned a great reputation for their uniformity and fineness, and they were widely called Joachim's Thalers. The name dollar eventually emerged from Thaler, and eventually they were called trade dollars. As gold and silver had emerged as the reigning monies, the Founding Fathers declared that only gold and silver coin can be money in America, and gave the Congress power, quote, to coin money and regulate the value thereof, unquote, United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. In the 1784 debate concerning the nation's dollar unit of money, Thomas Jefferson said this, quote, If we determine that a dollar shall be our unit, we must then say with precision what a dollar is, unquote. With this in mind, Congress wrote the night. Congress wrote the 1792 Coinage Act. That's the night... I keep getting that transposed. It's the 1792 Coinage Act. Amended in 1900 and still in effect today. Officially defining the dollar. Quote, Just as an inch is one-twelfth of a foot or a quart is one-quarter of a gallon, a dollar is one-twentieth of an ounce of gold. Ten elevenths fine. Unquote. Also included in that act was the provision that anybody convicted of debasing or diluting the gold content of the dollar would be put to death. This harsh penalty was a reflection of how strongly the people felt about the previous painful episode of the worthless inflationary continental currency. I hope I have your attention. And I'm sort of sorry that I do, because I must leave you hanging there, ladies and gentlemen, because we have run out of time. It is the intention of the hour of the time to wake the sheeple, empower the people, and try, try to save freedom, not just for the United States of America, but for the world. If I have your attention, if you are awake... If you realize now how you have been defrauded and scammed and lied to, then it's time to look in the mirror and say to yourself, I have been stupid. I have been ignorant. I have been apathetic. I am a sheeple. But I am going to try my best to become a real people, a real American. Go out and get yourself a copy of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence and join us in this fight to save our great nation. Good night, and God bless you all.
had better call Swiss America. Thank them for sponsoring the Hour of the Time. Mention my name, William Cooper. Thank them for sponsoring this program and ask for all the newsletters and information be sent to you. Do it now. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. You'll be glad that you did. America, land of the free, home of the brave? Not anymore. Not until Americans stop believing in these myths and these lies and these deceptions and these manipulations. We are all guilty. Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple and you are setting up the tables for them and building their booths. And you are groveling and shining their shoes and scraping their coats for them. You are moving back the walls of the temple so that they can be more firmly rooted. More firmly rooted. When Jesus spoke of the synagogue of Satan, he was not talking about a Hebrew temple. He was not talking about the Jews. You see, the temple that he himself attended, the temple that he threw the money changers out of, the temple that he said was the house of God, was a Jewish temple. And all you arrogant, idiot, racists out there who do not understand that when he spoke of the synagogue of Satan, he was talking about the old mystery religion of Babylon that was practiced in that day as well as this. And they are in control. The greater the truth, the greater the libel. Men are most apt to believe what they least understand. A truth's initial commotion is directly proportional to how deeply the lie was believed. It wasn't the world being round that agitated people, but that the world wasn't flat. When a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic, and that is what most of you have dubbed me. It takes two to speak the truth, one to speak and another to hear. It takes nothing to hear. It takes great courage to speak. For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I'm willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to prepare for it. And that was spoken by Patrick Henry. George Bernard Shaw said, If you do not say a thing in an irritating way, you may as well not say it at all, because people will not trouble themselves about anything that does not trouble them. My grandfather told me, Bill, when you die... If you do not have any enemies, you have never done anything right. The phones are open, 602-333-2174. You may say anything you wish. It's not required to agree with anything that I have spoken here, now or ever. Before Bill opens up the phone lines, I'd like to say that we are allowing our con constitution, our country, our freedoms to be taken away from us, and we must stop allowing that. We were not there standing by the church in Waco, Texas. We were not there, we Americans, standing on the steps at Washington for Project 93 to abolish the Federal Reserve and the income tax. We have another chance now, step three. In January, you could rethink your position on the income tax and take a step. We Americans could stand together. We must do this because we do not have much time left. We are confronting a large group, but not too large because we are larger. There are 250 million people in America. How many do you think we are opposing? A few million? We can do it. We must call the people who are treasonous, treason. We must say it. We must point out who they are and we must take them to task. Or we will lose our country forever and freedom. Please listen. 
Good evening, you're on the air. Yeah, this is Grover. Bill, he's, uh, William, you're, uh, probably going to stay up awful late every night. Uh-huh. Okay, what you do? If you remember me calling last night. Yes, I remember. I, uh, discussed all day today with my son before he went to work, but I had heard you say last night and what I had heard previously. And, uh, it's strange. Uh, there's a lot of little things that are out on, in, in the public, uh, that nobody ever uh, takes notice to. And when you was playing that song a while ago, I believe that was, uh, uh, oh, just went blank. I ain't gonna do that. Uh, uh, Come on, what's the point? <laughs> oh gosh, well anyway. It doesn't matter who sang the song. Okay, well, what's anyway, the point? Freedom is just another uh, word for nothing else to lose. And I was talking to my son about that today. And uh, freedom, a uh, whole lot to lose, and democracy has nothing to do with the public. It's a self-destructing government. That's right. And I can't get across my son. He says, oh, we're democracy. It looks like I'm going to have to get into research and reading and, and, and get into this. Because you make me feel kind of stupid, and I thought I was a little bit smart. Hey. <laughs> I was stupid, too, for many years. And uh, I'm a... Uh, Hey, listen, I, I love the way you come across. I mean, that's what it's going to take for these people. People are sheeple, and I swear they have to be drove. You can't believe them. They have to be drove. I appreciate you. I'm not saying more. Hank Williams Jr. was singing that song. Uh, that's right. Yeah, okay. I put it on my mind. I got a one-track mind. Uh, but freedom is not another word. Freedom is a word we all have to fight for. That's correct. Freedom is a very important word. We have nothing unless we fight for it. It means nothing to nobody unless we fight for it. There's not a thing you have in your house that's <laughs> appreciate unless you have worked hard for it. That's correct. And uh, I know there's other callers. Yeah, we got to go. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling. Appreciate you. Really do. Thank you. Our country was founded in the root of the common law. The common law says that you have nothing unless you yourself can fight for it and preserve it and keep it, and no one else can do it for you. Good evening, you're on the air. Hello. Goodbye. Try it again. Good evening, you're on the air. I'm Phil. Yes. This is Larry from Monroe, Louisiana. How you doing tonight? Good. Uh, listen to the first part of your show. I had to cut the radio off. It's too much static. I just want to say, God bless you, Bill. You're doing a hell of a job. Well, thank you. You had your guts. I mean, compared to you, I'm a coward. I mean, I haven't paid income tax in 13 years, but it's not because it's because I haven't worked at a job in 13 years. I understand. Uh, I wish I had your guts. I'm, I'm uh, uh, just, you know, I want to tell, I want to tell. I want to tell the New World Order to go to hell. And I, and I hope they're listening. I wish they'd come and get me. I can guarantee you they listen to this show. I want to make a stand, whether it costs me my life or not. I'm I'm, I'm sick and tired of, of the bullshit in this, that's going on in this, in this country, in this world. And and there's just very few people like you who have the guts to, to, to say what you're saying tonight with the with the... The conviction that you say it with, and I just want to say, God bless you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for calling. Good night. Good night. 602-333-2174. Remember, folks, don't put me up on a pedestal. I'll fall off real quick. I'm just like the rest of you. I'm just awake. I am awake, and I am angry. I understand what we're losing. I look at my children, and I know what they will not have if I do not stop this. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello, Bill. This is Dave in Northern Illinois. Hello, Dave. And all I'd like to say is freedom can only be won. The warfare is continuous, and each generation comes to the front to fight for it as though the battle had just been joined. That's by Bishop R.A. Brown. Well, those are good words. Have you ever heard that one before? No, I haven't. I'll add that to my little repertoire here. Yeah, that's in the book, The Most Secret Science, by Archibald E. Roberts. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Have good a good night. One. Thank you for calling. 602-333-2174. Don't forget Carolyn's here if you'd like to talk to her. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi. How you going? <laughs> you asked me that after everything? <laughs> uh, I've been listening to you for a few months. Uh, great. Um, I really do enjoy it. However, I have to say something about the Brady Bill. 
Go for it. Uh, one of the parts on the Brady Bill, and I have in front of me the um, conference report that is attached to HR 1025. And part of the requirement is that you have to get a letter in writing from your local sheriff and or chief of police that you have been accosted by somebody and therefore you require a handgun. And the deal is, if you can't get this letter in writing from your chief, you can't get a handgun. Well, I beg to differ with you. That's not true. That's for people who have to have a handgun like right now, today. If I go down and say, I've got to have a handgun right now, today, then that's what I have to do to get it today. Otherwise, I have to wait five days. Yes, but uh, if you look at... No, there's no buts. I've read the whole bill. Five days to start with to get the permit uh, application going. Then no, no, that's not true. That's, that's not true. That's not true. Well, that's what I have in front of me. Well, it's not what I have. Uh, can I send you a copy? You certainly can. Just hang on a second so I can get a piece of paper and okay. get your address so I can send it to you. Okay. The number, the address, folks, is William Cooper, Post Office Box 1420, P.O. Box 1420. Yep. Sholo, spelled S-H-O-W-L-O-W, two words, Sholo, Arizona, 85901. 85901. Yes. You will have that on Monday or Tuesday. Thank you very much. You're in for a shock. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I don't think I'm in for a shock. We have the Brady Bill, uh, unless somebody's putting out a phony copy of the Brady Bill. The Brady Bill has yet to be written. It has been signed on this conference report. The actual bill is not going to come down for six weeks, and that's coming from my congressman in this area. This is in eastern Pennsylvania. Well, i got news for you, friend. Your congressman is pulling the wool way over your eyes. I hope so. A bill cannot be signed unless it's been written. It's been passed into law. It's been signed by the president. We have a copy of it. Tell your congressman to go fish. I hope you can. <laughs> I really do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. 602-333-2174. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello, Mr. Cooper. Hello. Hello. Um, I was just curious, how computer literate are you? Because uh, I'm a college student here in Wisconsin. And do you know anything about, like, the worldwide computer network called the Internet? Hey, let me tell you something. I've been on computer networks before, and you can take all those little social misfits that hide behind their uh, modems and their uh, screens and strike out at the world and stick them where the sun don't shine and don't want anything to do with them. Okay, because I, I just wanted to tell you that uh, your word has been spreading like wildfire all over the network. Well, that's good. But I still don't want anything to do with those people. I've been on there. I've watched the, the character assassinations and the attacks made upon people uh, and the, the viciousness that uh, exists on those computer networks uh, by little, little twit nerd cowards that wouldn't have the balls to stand in front of me and even open their mouth, much less say anything like that. Well, it's obviously not the same people I associate with then because the people I associate with are quite mature and they can discuss these things in a mature manner. Well, I've never been on a computer network where I saw anything discussed in a mature manner. I've seen people throw out an idea and get absolutely crucified. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about just vicious attacks on people for no reason whatsoever other than they, they expressed uh, their, themselves uh, on the net. Now, if you're on that net, you know that that's true. Yes, I've seen it, too. Okay, so don't bullshit me. I know it's true. 602-333-2174 is the number. <clears throat> Good evening. You're on the air. Yes. Um, I just want to tell you, I appreciate your program. And uh, do you know where a person could get a good copy of the Constitution? Do you all have any? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, let me give you an address right here. You can write to the Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution. Write this down. Just uh, write to the Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution, 808 17th Street, Northwest, okay. Washington, D.C., 
202-202-2006. There's a phone number that you can call. It's 202-USA-1787. Uh, the, the reason I was asking, <coughs> I think it would be nice. You know, it'd be for, pretty inexpensive for anybody to run off copies and, you know, and give them. People. Well, that's about what people have to do because it's hard to find a copy that's true and correct. Yeah. And that's that's what I was doing when I left New Hampshire. If you've listened, listened to an earlier program, uh, I Xeroxed them off. I had them in larger print so that we used uh, four sides of paper, two pieces of paper with four sides, and I just gave them out, and that was my entree to say hello and talk to people. Well, I've, I've thought about that. Um, I'm a piano technician by trade, and I see a lot of people every day, and I'm, I'm just amazed, you know, where people are. They don't know anything that's going on, and most of them don't care. That's right. And, uh, you know, I've had, uh, like when the fire was awake, I went to a lady's house, and I was, I was hot, you know, just really mad. And... Uh, the first thing, you know, she said, well, there's too many guns here. And I said, okay, one day you'll wish you had some around, you know, if you don't change your attitude. And, you know, I probably ne never worked for her again, but, you know, people better wake up. Yes, they better. And uh, everyone out there, listen to me. The Constitution says the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Period. Shall not be infringed. Any law that's passed restricting the sale or the possession of firearms in this country or any weapons whatsoever or the registering of weapons whatsoever or unconstitutional laws do not have to be obeyed and I'm telling you right now do not ever give up your weapons it is the only thing that stands between us and slavery at this very moment if Americans had been disarmed last week you would already be slaves tonight well the, the thing you know, I think a lot of people, they, they just see one side of it. And, uh, I think you're wrong. I don't think they see any side of it. Most people don't even know what in the hell is going on and could care less. I know. I was uh, talking to somebody. They were, you know, just crucifying the uh, uh, Surgeon General, I guess it was, about the drug deal. And I said, okay. I said, if you think about it, it was nothing but propaganda that made uh, hemp illegal to grow anyway. That's right. And it's, you know... Legalize all that stuff and half of our problems would disappear right. overnight. Because, you know, most of it is it's artificial. Yeah. And farmers would have a new cash crop that would be incredible, incredibly right. productive and economically satisfying for this country. i got to let you go, my friend. Thanks. Thanks for calling. Six zero two three 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 two one seven four. Good evening. You're on the air. Mr. Cooper. Yes. Can you handle any more of Patrick Henry tonight? Sure. Go ahead. We are not weak. If we make proper use of those means which God of nature has placed in our power, millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty, and in one, and in such a country as that which we possess, we are invincible. Besides, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations, who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle is not to the strong alone. It is the vigilant, the active, the brave. Many cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war has actually begun. Why stand we here idle? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Wonderful. <laughs> I thought it fit in very well with your program tonight. Great program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling. Yes, good night. 602 Got time for another couple of calls. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, hello, uh, Bill. This is John from Virginia. Hi, John. Uh, just a quick question for you. I, I agree with almost everything you're saying. Um, where do people get the courage to stick their foot over the line? Even the people that hear this and know it's true, who have families as you do, where do they get the courage to stick that foot over the line and say, I'll take a chance, I won't file, I'll step across this line? Uh, well, you're not stepping across the line if you do it within the law. I mean, you just don't decide not to file. 
You have to do it within the law. You have to revoke your social security status. You have to become, once again, a citizen of your state. There are certain things that you must do. You must revoke all contracts and all signatures. You must declare your sovereignty, again, under the law. You must do all of these things. And you must do it legally. Have you done that? But, but you're not stepping over a line, my friend, if you are within the law. That's why these people who were arrested... See, they tell the newspapers that these people are criminals because they were teaching people how to untax themselves legally. So the sheeple out there hear that and they say, oh, these people got busted because they weren't paying taxes. That's not true. You know what the charges are? Mail fraud. Because they claimed 100% success and the U.S. Postal Department regulations say you cannot claim 100% success. Right. Well, my hat's off to you. I, I just... Uh it seems to me if you could get the ball rolling and get a, a little bit of a, maybe a half of a percent of people doing this, it would take off. And it would all be over. But that's the hard part is getting that ball rolling. Appreciate your efforts. Only 3% of the colonists fought the Revolutionary War and brought this nation to fruition. They were all traitors against the King of England. They all stepped over the line without them, without their courage, without their genius, none of us would be free today, my friend. Very true. Thank you. Thank you for calling. What do you mean, step over the line? How dare you send your children off to fight a war in the desert somewhere? How dare you send me to fight a war in Vietnam? And then ask me something like that. And don't take it personally. I'm talking to all of you. If you pat your sons and daughters in the ass and send them off to fight a war in a foreign country and you haven't got the balls to stand up and fight for your own rights in this country, then as far as I'm concerned, I better not say it. Good evening, you're on the air. Yeah, Bill, this is Rich in Willow Springs, Missouri. Hello, Rich. I just wanted to let you know that I'm one of those sovereigns. I filed the book for work and everything last year. Wonderful. And uh, it all does work. It's kind of a hassle for a while. Yeah, it's a hassle. Yeah. But nothing worth having is ever easy. Yeah, and I really enjoy your show. Thank you. And you have yourself a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling. Now, if you've been watching the news, especially the news broadcasts about these arrests that have been made, they have been telling you that 10,000 Americans, names that they got off the list of these people, are going to be paid a visit. What a joke. Do you know how many IRS agents there are in this whole country? They couldn't pay 10,000 people a visit in 10,000 years, my friends. They are 90% bluff, just like the IRS agent said. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, Mr. Cooper? Yes. Uh, weren't the founding fathers mostly Masons? Yes, they were. Uh, is it possible they built into the Constitution and everything, all the problems we're having today? No, that's built into you and me, my friend. They just gave us the means to do it should we fail. You see, this was the great experiment. That's exactly what they called it. The great experiment was to find out whether man could truly keep his sovereignty and rule himself, or whether he needed someone to rule over him. And one other thing. Uh, we're, we're failing the experiment. Is it possible that communism failed because uh, what we have in this country was a better form of control of people than communism? Uh, no, uh, that's not why communism failed. Communism failed because it's time to bring about the one world government, and you can't do it if you have the guise of two superpowers opposing each other. The Soviet Union was created by London, Wall Street, and Rome to serve a purpose, to create an antithesis to the Western world, to drag the funds and taxes and monies out of the people, to build the technology to rule the sheeple in the New World Order. They built the police force from our taxes that are going to enslave us in the future. Now, see, I've kind of thought of this uh, design competition. No, nope, not at all. Oh. It's, it's thesis, antithesis, clash between the two, the synthesis which brings everything closer to one. Uh, when do you see all this finally happening? 
happening when they finally lock us down. How can, how can you guys ask me that? It's been happening. It's still happening. You've almost lost all your rights, and you're asking me when this is going to happen? I don't understand. I mean, what is it? There were a thousand people that came to Washington to abolish the Federal Reserve and the income tax, or maybe there were close to 2,000 people. That was September 29th, 1993. How many people came to Waco to stand by our fellow Americans who were fighting in their church for their life and who lost their life? And that's an exact picture of what is going to happen to us. Bill said something about, I forget, but I wanted to add that we will be killed as well. There are many of us who are going to be killed in this and struggle. Yes, ma'am. Oh, well. It's not when is it going to happen. It's happening. You're in the midst of it now. It's not. It's no longer when. The country is gone right now. We've lost our country. Uh, the only thing we can do is wake up and take it back before it's too late. Yes, sir. Uh, have you pushed to your listeners that all of Congress is coming up for re-election next year? Hey. <laughs> That's 12 months down the road. Uh, well, not only that, but uh, we're out of time. Good night, folks, and God bless you all.